Hello, welcome. Um, hello, welcome. Um, my name is George Maurer. Uh, so this is a recording of my talk, Be the Sexiest, as you might have seen it at Houston Tech Fest or uh, New York Code Camp or anywhere else. Um, wh what I really um, am setting out here to do is um, show some of the features um, of JavaScript to make it really uh, good and pleasant to work with um, because a lot of times they're not explicitly discuss uh, discussed. Specifically, um, I think it's high time now that uh, ES6 features are starting to be deployed in the browser to be looking, in, to be looking uh, toward the future and kind of using some of these features and seeing how they fit together and how they can help make a very nice programming experience uh, working in this language. So um, I'm going to be doing live coding today. I, I have a GitHub repository right here, so you'll be able to go on there, follow along. Everything is uh, broken down into tags uh, for step one, step two, step three, and so on. Um, in addition, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, and I want to start a little bit just by talking about the history of, of JavaScript and of the web. And I've, I've talked about this a lot in um, many other forums, but the long and the short of it is that uh, JavaScript was designed in 10 days. And in those 10 days, uh, and, and basically this was back in 1993 when uh, Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator were uh, vying for supremacy, and at that time, it was it was very straightforward. They realized that they that we need a programming language. You know, you go to Orbitz, you click uh, the calendar for what day you're gonna leave, and uh, you want to you want some a little programming language that'll run and rearrange the HTML and CSS on the page in order to make a little calendar pop up. And so, and this need was obvious, and basically the race was on. Netscape wants to be first to market, so they uh, pretty much stick their head out the door and say, uh, Brendan Ike, you, your smart research guy that we just hired, uh, go ahead and make us a new programming language. Oh, by the way, we want to beat Intent Explorer to market, so you've got ooh, 10 days. So, uh, Brendan Ike takes that as a challenge, locks himself in a conference room basically for 10 days, um, and just writes an interpreter, writes a language spec, and uh, basically creates a whole programming language. And he comes out of there, uh, presents it to his bosses. Uh, Mark Andersi and some marketing guys are in the room, and he said, this is, this is my programming language. I've based it on um, some languages I've studied and enjoyed in the past, um, like Scheme and Self. Um, and they say, yeah, this is great, awesome what you've done. Um, well, we got these marketing guys in the room, and they're going to need to take the stuff and sell it. So, there's this other programming language that has nothing to do with yours right now uh, called Java. Can you make your language look kind of like Java so that we can sell it as JavaScript? Um, then, technically, it was it, it was initially uh, called MocoScript and then LiveScript, and eventually got licensed with JavaScript. Um, and so Brendan Dyke shrugs, goes off, uh, adds some semicolons, adds some uh, curly braces, and then we get JavaScript, and then nothing much happens for the next five, six years. Um, in fact, um, you know, so JavaScript does end up winning, and Netscape Navigator folds, but JavaScript itself persists, and Internet Explorer adopts it. Um, but... The interesting thing is, no, no one's really doing much with it beyond those little calendar widgets, which perhaps is all it was designed for in the begin with. Um, so this kind of persists until about 1998, uh, when Microsoft uh, is making Apple Web Outlook, and they uh, uh, and they need a way to check from the server whether you have a new email without refreshing the forcey page refreshes. So they uh, basically invent Ajax. And then nothing much happens again until 2004, until Gmail comes along and does exactly the same thing. But this time, people actually pay attention, and we start getting, uh, we start having people understand that, hey, you know, the the Java revolution on the web that was predicted, Java applets, 
has not happened, but this JavaScript thing is pretty powerful. And maybe this can be the application server that was that we always wanted. Um, so just uh, in, in kind of that whole revolution starts and still nothing much happens with JavaScript. You know, there's a couple small additions to the language, which are not insignificant in the late 2000s, but um, until right now in 2015, when some of the um, next version features of JavaScript are being spec and starting to drop, um, we were still missing some very core language features. Um, so, so at this point, um, you know, we're at a point where that's, where well, it's starting to change and it's all very new and very exciting. And I, I think it's worth it to kind of talk about, um, uh, that stuff. So, um, uh, you know, so when, whenever you kind of are looking at JavaScript and you, a lot of people I know don't like it or are still coming from an understanding of it. Uh, that, that really branches back in the day. Um, keep in mind that it's weird, and why is it so weird? Well, because it was designed 10 days, marketed to look like a completely different programming language, and then no one did anything with it until very, very recently. So, so uh, kind of with that understanding, I'd like to kind of get, uh, get started. Um, before I go off, a couple uh, things to recommend. I'm just reading material. If you if you're a JavaScript developer, JavaScript the good parts is your Bible. It it, it really needs to be. Now I, I personally don't agree with everything in it. Um, I think a lot of stuff in it is a little too strict. But if you're a beginning JavaScript developer who does not have opinions on this stuff, following every piece of info, every piece of advice in there, you'd be fine. The other thing I want to recommend is uh, JavaScript Alange. Uh, by Reginald Brathwaite, um, specifically the sixth edition, which uh, talks uh, about ES6 features, and in this, um, he really doesn't. He really tries not to dwell too much in the Java part of JavaScript and really get back to kind of the Lisp and the Lisp processing and functional language roots and kind of teach you to think um, how to work with JavaScript in the way it was meant to be worked with. Um, so uh, before, before we begin, I want to explicitly kind of mention the features of JavaScript that make it really pretty nice language to work with. Um, and specifically, we've got first order functions, so functions for everything. You can have a function as a parameter, just as easily as you can assign a function to a variable, just as easily as you can declare a function. And really, there's very little difference in between all those. It's a prime basic concept. Then we've got JSON notation. It's easy to create objects, um, which uh, if you're coming from a strong, uh, stricter functional language, that's similar to the concept of tuples. Um, hoisting, which becomes a really neat, is a really misunderstood and becomes a really neat feature that can help keep your code nicely organized. Um, and I'll be demoing some of that. Boolean type coercion, which again, let's just say some typing and instinctively makes a lot more, a lot of sense over languages which don't support that. And then we've got all the stuff that was added in ES6. The, bi uh, the biggest thing by far, probably the biggest feature in JavaScript period that's gonna change everything is uh, JavaScript modules, which really is the thing that makes that make uh, JavaScript a true modern programming language. Um, in addition to that, we have generators, which um, if you come from a C-sharp background like, like I do, um, you could you can think of as just yield and await together and just on PCP and able to do so much more. Um, then we got um, arrow functions. Um, I like arrow functions, specifically the single line variant of arrow functions. Um, spread and splat operators. Uh, destructuring of both objects and arrays. The constant let keyword and simple object construction. Now those last few, those last five. Um, are, are, are certainly nice to have. So they're not nearly as big deals as, uh, as the first two. But uh, I think we'll demonstrate it and uh, hopefully you like it. So let, let, let's go ahead and do some code. Um, all right, to get started with, I just want to show you what it is that uh, we're going to be creating. So um, 
I just wanted to kind of create a simple library of the type that people might want to use. Uh, not, not, not that you would use this directly, but, but this is the sort of thing that you might be asked to create in your project. So it's going to be a notifications library. And here we have a little text box. Uh, and, and you can kind of put messages in there and notice you never are going to get more than five at a time and you can clear them out and what's one thing that's a nice additional feature is if I reload the page notice it's going to uh, actually pop up the last few messages that we've saved so, so this is the kind of uh, the sort of the thing that we're going for especially the kind of the library that drives this um, now, I, I've already kind of created a template for you, so you don't have to uh, actually figure out how to do this, uh, how to do all, set up a lot of the basics for you. Um, so this is, this is the GitHub repository. Go ahead and clone that. Um, so you either do a git clone or download it. You will need to have Node installed um, in order to do anything, but that's really the only dependency that you should have. So once you have that, we're going to run npm install to just download um, Actually, it's any server-side dependencies. The only server-side dependencies in this application um, are going to be for the very, very simple web server that I wrote. Now, again, none of none of the stuff that I'm doing is actually tied at all to the build process or to the web server or really uh, very strongly to Node. Um, that's just, it just I just needed some sort of web server in order to demonstrate this stuff, and that's what I chose. Um, you will need to run one more command here. Um, so we are using um, JSPM to provide ES6 features. Now, a lot of these, um, it's going to be npm run JSPM inst colon install. So a lot of uh, these features that we discussed on um, the command of ES6 are actually starting to drop in browsers already. By the time you're watching this, none of none of the JS, this JSPM stuff should be necessary. Would be necessary, um, or, or or it might still be. the The biggest feature that we're missing is ES6 modules. So uh, what we're going to do is use a tool called JSPM in order to both pull down some dependencies, uh, some minor dependencies that we have and to uh, do things like provide us with the ability to use ES6 modules. And I'll go over a little bit how it works. There is not a build step at all. I want to stress that. Um, and now J the way JSPM works is, out, is kind of outside the um, realm of this talk, but I, I, I strongly encourage using it. it. It works really, really great. So once we do have this downloaded, basically you're just going to go npm start and that's going to start up our application and we can go ahead and open that link and we get this page so i have already kind of written a lot of the html and uh, css for you so let's go ahead and show the html pretty straightforward um, i think a lot of people don't know in html5 you know all the doc type html uh, body head stuff. Most of that isn't necessary anymore. It's not really in the spec. The browser can figure it out. Um, so this this is nice little. Uh, it's just a nice little bonus, right? I understand that. And here we have a form with a label inside of it, just uh, with with uh, two buttons, one that submits and one that resets. Nothing strange at all. Let's look down here. So here we have uh, this uh, call to load up system.js. So uh, what JSPM actually does is tie together uh, two other technologies, um, namely System.js, which is a JavaScript modules polyfill. That is, a, it's a library that'll take the browser uh, that will um, give you the um, JavaScript modules interfaces in your browser so that you can use them. And then in the background, it'll be converting everything to compatible code. Um, and this is all, again, in JavaScript in your browser. Um, and then we have our config.js, which is just a configuration file I wrote the, the, that configures how uh, system will work. And then right now, we, we go ahead and kick off uh, our JavaScript uh, modules application with system.import and just the name of the file. So uh, let, let's look at what happens there. Um, all right. So right here. 
we're uh, going to go ahead and grab our form, um, add some event listeners to it. Um, and when we do that, we're not going to actually go ahead and submit. But what we are going to do is uh, take our, grab our value, increment a counter, and uh, we're going to have this notifications object, which is created by some create notification queue function. So we woke that create our object, and then it's going to have an add function, and then we'll, we'll put, click the reset button. It's going to have a clear function. So nothing uh, too crazy or confusing there. Um, so a couple things I, I, I'd like to point out about this. Um, first of all, we're not using jQuery at all because at this point, eh, browsers have had the Create Query Selector API for a while. Add Event Listener is more verbose than, J than jQuery is on, but it's not significantly worse. Um, and, and really at this point, I'm finding less and less that you really uh, need jQuery. So a, a couple other a couple other things. Um, we've got the let and the const keyword going on here. So as of uh, as of this talk, which is in September 2015, the const keyword is already in many browsers. Let is not. Let, so th these are basically going to replace your var keyword. Um, the var keyword doesn't do quite what most people want it to do, and then which is something you probably you can read up on more. Uh, basically, if if you have a var keyword in a function, it's available everywhere in the function, not just starting from where it's declared. The let keyword is gonna, is, uh, gonna go ahead and fix that, which means you can use the let keyword correctly in for loops and in if blocks, and it'll work um, kind of as you think it should. <coughs> the const keyword is gonna be similar, but with the added benefit of this reference cannot be reassigned. So my kind of advice on that is use const wherever appropriate. And if you're going to be reassigning the variable, then go ahead and use let. And really, you would only need want to use var in like 0.001% of the time. You probably never do, to be honest. <coughs> A couple other things. Um, we're using arrow functions here. <coughs> so we don't have to type out function e like that, yay. Um, it's not a huge win, obviously, um, but once we, it does come with a couple of nice benefits. Now, I'm personally uh, very much against the use of the this keyword in JavaScript. <coughs> I find it to be complex and um, really unnecessary. Uh, if you do program in that style, <coughs> I'm sorry. If you do program in that style, however, um, you will find that error functions can work really well for you. Namely, uh, they are going to be in equivalent to doing this pattern, right? You're probably familiar with this, uh, which is a really nasty pattern to begin with, but then in using that inside of here. So arrow functions, uh, whenever you use this inside of an arrow function, it's actually going to refer to this from a previous scope. Um, another way you might have be used to doing it is something like by this. It's very, it's, uh, very similar in effect. Um, however, the part that I really like about them is their single line variant, which we'll demonstrate uh, later. Uh, and finally, we have here uh string templates so we can do string interpolation in javascript just like we always wanted to <coughs> so all these things are obvious nice to haves i don't think any of them are going to change the world as far as how we code javascript now here is where we ha we have the really big one though import create notification queue so what's the saying it's saying there's a create notification queue file um it's in the root of the wherever it's configured in this case it's configured just to be right next to the app.js file so from there we're going to grab something called create notification queue and it happens to be a function that we invoke and it will return our notifications object so let's take a look at our create notifications queue looks like okay we just learned that this is basically a function const and then multiplies. So it, this is just creates a function called create notification queue. And then we do export default. So what are we getting there? Oh, here it's just an empty function. 
So right now in our new application, if I go ahead and click go or clear, we can read property clear of undefined. And of course, because we don't have an add or clear property. So let's go ahead and do, and do that. Um, create notification queue. This is going to, so in create notification queue, we're going to be, um, you know, we need to return something with an add and a clear function. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to return and uh, we're just going to return an object and it'll have a clear method on it. It'll have an add method on it. Uh, so, and when we call these, nothing's going to happen. So a couple things to note. Hey, this is a nice little syntax for uh, methods, right? We don't have to do clear function like that, right? We could have always done that, but now we could just do this, uh, which is, you know, pleasant. Um, the bigger thing to note is uh, we're creating something that has some methods. And I'm going to demonstrate here that it works. So we're, we're not going to get any errors once this happens. But yay. Uh, so we're creating something with some methods and we're not using the new keyword. Now this is not a new feature of JavaScript at all. But it is something that's really often misunderstood because people uh, coming from Java and C-sharp backgrounds um, always think that in order to have methods and more things think to have something to chain off of, you need new keywords, you need to understand prototypal inheritance, and you don't at all. Um, matter, matter of fact, all you need, you don't need prototypal inheritance at all for this spec, for this usage. All you need is something with an add and a clear method. So we just use simple JSON notation to create something clear and add methods. And that way we don't have to worry about prototypal inheritance and so on and so on, which is just not worth it. it, it it's really confusing. It's not worth it. Okay, I'll caveat that. It's not worth it unless you're designing the next J jQuery or underscore and something really, really super performance sensitive. And even then you better understand the exact thing that the new keyword does and exactly how prototype like inheritance works. And if not, you're really just better off not using it at all. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's kind of make our function work a little bit. So, um, and we're going to need, uh, some sort of queue to hold our messages. I'm going to go ahead and let q equals and just create an array for it. Uh, now, clear, uh, oh, and then we'll do create a function, right? We'll call it show notifications. And inside of here, we'll just console.log current notifications q. There we go. Um, clear is going to be easy. Q equals, uh, we don't care what was in it before and show notifications. Add is going to be a little more difficult. So what we're going to want is Q to be the thing that was previously in the Q plus the new message. Okay. So let's, let's kind of look at this syntax because this is new. This is called the spread operator. Um, unfortunately, as, at the time of the recording this, this is not currently in uh, any browser, but it is coming uh, very soon. Um, basically, what this says is write it, Q is an array, write it out, uh, expand it as an array into this array. So if Q had one, two, three in it before and message was four, Q will now be one, two, three, and four. It's uh, actually the same as doing Q dot concat msg and it actually is what it usually uh, transpiles to uh, and then we'll of course do if q dot length is greater than I don't know let's say five uh, we'll go ahead and say q equals q dot slice one so go ahead and uh, set q with uh, by slicing off the first one so drop its first in first out so drop the one that was to furthest to the left and then we can show notifications here as well so let's go ahead and check whether that works and go ahead click go go welcome to this message and we do that and notice it's never going beyond five and we can clear it wonderful it all works 
Um, so, um, one thing I want to note about this, me personally, I don't like mutable objects. I find it much more reason easier to reason about state if we don't have like an array and we're changing it. If we just create new arrays, uh, you know, oh, from from scratch. So this is why I kind of use this style where I, I don't really modify the existing array. I'm just creating new arrays and assign, reassigning them to the variable. Now, if you really, really want to use uh, Q to push and uh, shift and splice, um, you know, that's not something I would flag in a code review. Um, JavaScript does perfectly well support that mode. Um, I personally find it harder to reason that about things that work that way, and therefore I avoid using them. Right? Um, so, and, and things like the spread operator are going to obviously make, make that a lot easier. All right, so we kind of we kind of have our state maintenance now. Uh, let's just, let's uh, go ahead and build up some UI. Um, so, what we would like would be some, would be well, we're going to need some sort of uh, container just uh, to contain the DOM elements that we'll put in it. So let's go ahead and create that. Const container, container equals, I'll just create a function that will make it uh, create notification. Uh, and what's that function going to look like? It'll be something like, uh, We'll go ahead and do um, a const, uh, we'll create an element, and I'm going to assume that we're going to have a create element function. We don't at the moment, but we'll, we'll go ahead and add that in a bit. And we'll do l dot class list dot add notifications. Right, tag it with a class of notifications. And uh, what else do we need? Document dot body dot append child l and then return the element itself so that should be uh nice and straightforward on uh, show notifications we're not going to need to uh console log anything anymore but we'll want to uh go ahead and actually create our notifications objects so we might have something like uh well let's clear out our container right and then we're going to go ahead and say const. Um, so we're just going to get all our, uh, all our list items. And the way we're going to do is q.map. We're going to get a message in there. And we'll say something, create element. And we'll get with, this one will be a li, so a list item with this, mess, uh, with this message for its text content. Um, and then we'll say something like items that for each uh, item container dot append child item. So something like this uh, could possibly work. And then the only thing we're going to need is now to create create elements. So I'm actually going to create that up here. And uh, rather than using the function keyword, um, for I, I'll show, discuss in a bit why I'm doing this. When I do create element, I'm going to create it using a variable that I'm going to assign a function to. So this should be pretty straightforward. We're going to say a tag name, and then we're saying uh, what text content we want. So go ahead and do that. Uh, const o equals document dot create element. So this is now uh, just the basic uh, DOM create element creation stuff. So go ahead and add that in there. Uh, L dot text content equals text content and return L. All right, so now if we go ahead and refresh this page, we're gonna be able to say that, oh, and look, our messages is, are popping up and they never exceed five and we can clear them and we can add some more, wonderful. Um, a couple of th now, a couple of things to point out. Um, first and foremost, 
we have these arrow functions right here. So notice what's happening here, if you you're, might be used to it more in these terms, function, return, like that. Well, here's the rule. When using an arrow function, if it's only a single line, you don't need the embraces, and if you omit the braces, the return is implied. So the only line in the function is also going to be returned. And that's super, super useful for callbacks such as this, right? Um, very, very useful because now it's just a lot less typing. And we're, and we're doing these single line callbacks so much in our code. So as opposed to the multi-line stuff like right here, well, we had to have a return keyword. If it's a single line, we don't need it at all. Um, so let's see, uh, a couple other things. Uh, well, first of all, if we look at this, we notice that our messages have still not disappeared, right? There's nothing that's actually taken off the screen. Um, so I'm actually going to use CSS to do that, but I, I am going to have a JavaScript helper to kind of kick off that process. Um, so if we look, uh, right here, we have a DOM utilities file that's just sitting on disk right next to create notifications queue. And here it exports something called show temporarily. Okay. Um, and basically all it's going to do is toggle a class, which will allow CSS to kick in. Um, so let's go ahead and use that show temporarily thing file. So what we would like, of course, uh, is after we show notifications, so show temporarily container. Um, of course, that's uh, not going to work. Show temporarily is not actually visible in this file. It's not a global function. We need to actually bring it in. So import show temporarily from DOM utilities. And if we do, and if we do that way, we're going to be able to let's refresh our page. Uh, right. Oh, I got DOM utilities. I misspelled it, as I always do. Utilities. All right, and now if we go ahead and populate some messages, five, four, three, two, one, and it fades out. Great. Um, now we'll talk about a little bit about this, uh, how, how this looks and why it works the way it does in a second. Um, one thing I wanna point out, create element. That doesn't really belong here. That sounds more like a DOM utility. So let's go ahead and move that into there. In fact, right here, I have a create element right there. And we're gonna go in here and add in comma create element. And now we should be able to use create element everywhere, right? And no, create element is not a function. So what's going on here? Let's take a look at this import statement. So first of all, it's saying import from DOM utilities. The dot slash is actually optional in this case, but I, I, in this case, I'm, I'm finding it, it it's, it's useful to say, hey, this is a library file, so relative to this library file, it's going to be in the same area. And then what it's saying is, I'm expecting there to be two things tagged with the export keyword in a file, show temporarily and create elements. So if we look here, show temporarily is tagged with export. That means it's available outside the file. And here we have a create element where because we copy pasted, we don't have, we forgot our export keyword and we go ahead and refresh it and now it's going to start working again okay so we have the basics of our notification queue working um, let's take some time a minute to clean up our code so first of all I don't like that these functions are here um, they are kind of in the way right um, they certainly don't have anything to do with the actual creating of a notification queue. They're kind of um, helper functions. So when I have when I do this, 
what I like to do um, is grab these functions and either move them to a module or bump them down to the bottom of the file. So this is still going to work right now um, because of a concept in JavaScript called hoisting. And this is a very poorly understood concept, but what it, what it basically um, it says is when the JavaScript parser reads a function, so here we go, we have uh, this function right here, right, this scope. Um, when a JavaScript parser enters the scope, it actually does a couple scans. Uh, it scans through one time to uh, pick out the, any function keywords, any var keywords, and treats them as if they were declared at the top of the function. Um, because it is impossible to uh, for a function declaration that is something that uses the function keyword to create the function rather than var some variable equals fu uh, anonymous function. Um, because it's impossible to separate this from the function declaration from the actual implementation, it'll bump the entire implementation up to the top. So I had said previously the var is, hoisting is almost never helpful. Uh, Function hoisting, on the other hand, is very helpful because what it allows us to do is take functions that are used kind of locally in this function and bump them down toward the bottom where it's away from the meat of what's actually going on and kind of treated as helpers. Um, this is a lot of what, what those of you who come from like kind of class uh, pro oriented object, object oriented uh, program backgrounds might do where you bump private functions uh, toward the bottom of a, fi of a file because what's important is the public stuff and what, what uh, it actually does when someone enters this library and starts looking at the code. 90% of the time, they care about this stuff and not the details of how a container is created. So uh, let's go ahead and just make sure that everything still works. And we will see that it does. Great. Um, so what else? Well, we still have this uh, kind of arbitrary five here, right? Uh, queued on length is five. So what, what would be really nice if we could do is when we create our queue, we could say something like uh, keep latest three, right? And then it would uh, only keep the latest three notifications instead of five. Well, what could we do? We could take, uh, you know, an op, uh, options object in there and test whether it has the latest property and assign it to a variable and give the variable a default, right? And do, then do something, keep latest like that. But there's an easier way now, in, uh, now that we have ES6 and it looks like this, keep latest there. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to expect an object to come into create notifications container, that object is going to have a keep latest property, pluck that property out into a local variable, and now it's going to be available for use. So now if I go ahead and refresh this, where do I have this? This is not defined. Okay, I am missing something then. Oh, right. I meant to put it right there. <laughs> of course, it makes a lot more sense. So uh, so the, here we have create a notification queue when it's being configured. Assume an object is coming in, pluck out the cleat latest property, put in a variable. One, two, three and now we're keeping only the latest three. Um, of course, where does, uh, where does that leave our default of five, right? It doesn't exist anymore. So we can add that back in very easily because, Java, because ES6 now has default parameters. So you can provide default parameters to any parameters and functions. I believe this is in, uh, currently in browsers. So now if, even if this right here, we didn't include that. We will still work. Okay. Let's remove that completely and actually refresh the page. 
and O will see it cannot read keep latest of undefined. So this is a, a, an interesting thing to point out. This says, assume an option as object is coming in, pluck out the keep latest property, assign five to it if it is undefined, and, and put that in a variable. Well, 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 what we have here is we don't account for the possibility that nothing at all is passed into there. So the way we do that, we can actually use default parameters on the object itself. And yes, this is a little ugly, but it really does make sense as far as how it works. So now if I go ahead and refresh that, it's going to load without issues because it'll basically say, okay, if no object is passed in, then use the empty object. Obviously that doesn't have a keep latest property, which means, uh, which means keep latest will be assigned the default of five. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of indent it to clean it up a little bit. All right, something like that. All right, well, that, that really brings us, uh, you know, we, we have the basics working, but that brings us to uh, the part where we want uh, things loading up, right? So we we uh, we want to save the latest stuff that we we want to save our uh, our current queue, and then we're gonna um, and, and when we uh, when we start up the container, we want to show it. Um, so if we go ahead and uh, kind of think of how that we would want that to work. Um, well, we're gonna, we want the concept of a store, right? And a store, well, what's it gonna do? It's gonna be able to save and it'll be able to get. Now, each of these might be asynchronous operations, so each of these will uh, return uh, asynchronously. Uh, so let's go ahead and assume we have a store variable here. Uh, so how's it gonna work? Well, save is gonna be easy, right? We just do store.save queue. And we'll take that exact same thing and bump it down here as well. So saving, go ahead and save the queue in that case. Um, showing things might be a little different. So let's say we want something like load saved notifications, right? And what would that look like? Function um, save notifications. Well, if we think about it, we're going to have uh, do something like Q equals store dot get. But that's not quite right, because that's going to be a sync. So that's really going to return a promise. And well, we can't really at the time this runs, the DOM might not actually have finished loading. So we want to finish for the DOM to be ready. And right here, I actually provide a dom ready helper but if you notice it also returns a promise that resolves when the dom is ready so all right and then after that it's as easy as show notifications so what could we do we can of course take the promises and chain them together that that's easy enough um but there is a, but now in ES6, and this is actually something that's been in browsers for a while, there's actually an easier way to do it, and that's using uh, generators. Now, generators are not explicitly for this purpose, but this is probably going to be the biggest use case, uh, at least at first, if people use them. So to use a generator, so basically uh, what, what a generator does is it allows us to use the yield keyword. In order to do that, we're gonna tag our function with an asterisk, and then we can say yield. And I'll explain what that does in a second. And yield to this promise as well. So what's that gonna do? Well, uh, uh, when a function uh, that's a generator is invoked, it doesn't simply get the return value. What instead is returned is an object, right? And the object looks something like this. It's going to have a uh, next function. Uh, and 
when, and basically that's going to be your iterator, right? So now you could start calling iterator.next. And when you do, that tells the function to run until it hits the first key, key, yield keyword and then stop and return back whatever was passed to the yield keyword. Now you could go ahead and, and call iterator.next again. And you can pass in parameters and it's going to run again until it hits the next yield keyword and return back. And finally, it'll go over and over and over again. Actually, what it returns back is something like, you know, res is going to be something like value so, up to three or whatever was passed back, done, true, or done, false. Basically, whether the function is done being iterated and we're at the end of it. And we can kind of keep running through that function right up until it gets there. So in order to get this to work, we need one more concept. We can't just invoke the function. What we really want is something to say, okay, get the iterator, call yield on it. Then if you get a promise back, wait for that promise to be resolved and only then call next again. If you get a promise back again, go ahead and call next again and so on until you're done. So that's the concept of a coroutine and we, we could really implement it ourselves fairly easier. Um, however, uh, there's a couple caveats with error catching and so on. It's just better to use a library. So we do have a uh, little library here and really just uh, goes ahead and uses Bluebird's coroutine function. We're going to go ahead and say use that and say run coroutine. And by the way, this is all stuff that there's going to be language support for it in uh, in ECMAScript 7. It just doesn't happen to be yet, but it's okay because this really is this simple to do. Um, so in order to get this working, uh, we need to import our thing. So import run coroutine from utilities. Uh, and over right here we need DOM ready. So put DOM ready to tell us when the DOM is ready to work with. Uh, and after that, it's just a matter of picking out what store we want, right? Well, we have right here a custom notification store that I created that is actually doing get and post to uh, our little web server that we saved, uh, that we created. Um, our web server itself is very, very simple JavaScript server. You may notice basically what it's doing is it uh, is when you post to it, it'll take it and store just in a variable. And when it's responding, it's just returning the value that's in, in the variable. So very, very straightforward uh, little server. But let's go ahead and use this. So in our app, we're going to go ahead. Oh, right here we have store. And we expect a store variable. So we store, hold on, store. And then we feel silly because typing this out twice is kind of silly. And it turns out that in ES6, and again, this is in browsers now, you can simply omit that and you're telling it, hey, create a variable, create an object. Here I'm passing in a variable. It sees that variable name and assumes, of course, all right, the property name is named after the variable. So it's just a very little simple, nice to have to create objects in a way that makes you feel a little less silly. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and refresh a page. And if we did everything properly, we'll be able to save some messages. And then we're going to be able to refresh our page. And there we go. And our messages pop right back up. And if we look at our network tab, we see what happens. There was a get request and it was responded with those three messages. So again, to go over it one more time, this concept of uh, coroutines becomes really, really, really powerful because it allows us to program uh, to unwind our callbacks into a flat uh, programming style. So this right here, combined with co the concept of coroutines from Bluebird is saying, here is a promise. I'm returning, when the function is called, it's gonna return an object with a next 
function on it. When next function is called, you're gonna run until you hit uh, until you hit the first yield keyword, and you're gonna pass back what was passed to yield. If it happens to be a promise, the coroutine will take that, wait for the promise to be resolved, then call ne uh, next, which will run until it hits the next keyword, yield keyword, return another promise. The coroutine will wait for that promise to be resolved, call again, at that point we get reach the end of the function, which means that next returns a value of done is true, and then we're done. So this is all kind of handled for you uh, by the way generators work, which is a base JavaScript feature, which has actually been in JavaScript uh, for a little while, um, and the concept of coroutines and coroutine libraries. Okay, so now, so now we have, uh, you know, basically a working notification skew with background saving and stuff like that. Um, one thing I don't like is that store is mandatory. It seems reasonable to uh, provide a default for it. So uh, I created uh, some default notification stores right here. So there's none, there's local. Okay. Uh, and what we're gonna do is, so let's go ahead and import them. And we could do something like import none from notification stores and then say store equals none. Of course, I don't really like I I don't really like typing that out that way. I, I kind of wish I want it to be more explicit, so I'd like to say stores dot none. Um so there's a couple ways to do that. If we look at notification stores, um, you'll notice that uh, none and local are both exported. Well, one of the things you can do now is actually say import everything and put it all in a variable and the properties of that variable will be whatever the properties of this were. So if export none, export local. Um, of course, you don't do select star and SQL, and it, it, it's not the best of ideas here as well, because you don't know exactly what's being brought in. So uh, we can actually provide a way of getting all the stores directly from here by saying export default. So provide it with a default export um, of, well, and we'll say none, none, local, local. And then we'll realize that we just talked about how none of that is necessary and we could just do this, right? So export a single object with a none and a local property. Go ahead and export that. Now, because it's exported as default, default is a, is kind of a, is a built into the language special keyword. If, if you could only have one thing that's exported default out of a module, and when you do, you no longer need the, uh, the braces. So think of it this way. If I'm exporting a bunch of stuff on a module using export, you use the braces similar to kind of like, okay, it, conceptually, it's actually a different mechanism, but conceptually, it's like an object being exported. Whereas if you're using the default thing, you don't need the braces because that's the default thing that gets exported. So we can go ahead and refresh and make sure we didn't break anything. And it's gonna go ahead um, and work. So that's uh, pretty cool. Um, one more thing I don't like about this is these two lines right here, store.save, show notifications, um, they're redundant. And you could easily kind of imagine that going to a couple things that happen whenever the queue is modified. So what if we could, can we refactor all that stuff into a kind of a commonplace? Well, we could, of course, uh, add, a sing, add a single function right there. I wanna show a slightly different technique. So what would be nice if we could kind of tag this function as something that saves and shows notifications, just implicitly, right? So something like this, save and show. 
In that case, um, it's not going to be an arrow function anymore. It'll be like a simple like that. So how's that going to work? Well, we're going to go ahead and create that right here. Function, save and show. It's going to take a function as a parameter. So first order functions, you can pass functions as parameters. What is being passed as a parameter? This function right here. Now from inside of there, we're going to return yet another function, right? And inside of that function, we're going to go ahead and call our function with the message. Or, uh, sorry, I'm going to do any of the arguments that I passed in. Just call it with any of the arguments that I passed in. And we're going to go back here and format that. So what's happening here is save and show is a function that's being passed in a function, returns another function, which is what actually adds up an add. When you call this function right here, it's going to take any amount of arguments that are passed in, pass all those arguments into the function. So this is similar to dot apply. If you use a spread operator in this way, um, it's, it's actually an easier way to do, uh, the, to use apply, right? Um, we'll pass uh, pass that to there and then always store and save. So clear starts using that as well. Save and show. And in the case of, key, of clear, it's even simpler because now it's just a single line function. So we can just collapse it like that. All right. So now that so that now that's uh, nice and kind of refactored and removed. Um, let's go ahead and verify that we can still show it and it will still work all right and there it is so um so this is the concept of first order functions and it's been in javascript forever uh, just really since the very beginning um, and incredibly incredibly powerful if you come from an object-oriented language it's similar to a concept of a decorator or an adapter or any really of the other design patterns which are all just kind of different ways of doing this exact same concept uh, one thing to note, um, in the future, uh, ES7 is going to uh, allow a different syntax. Where lots of people find this confusing, even though it's really not. And we'll be able to do something like at save and show, and then just kind of have our add function normally. Um, and that will really be, have the exact same effect as doing this. Um, one thing what also I'll go ahead and note and point out that because we're actually returning a function that's being assigned to clear and returning a function that's assigned to add, we can no longer use our method uh, method creation syntax. Um, it, it's unfortunate, but it, it's a fairly small uh, sacrifice. So uh, one more thing I want to demonstrate then before uh, before we go. In our utilities function, we have extend. Extend is an incredibly useful JavaScript function. So useful that every single library I can think of out there has a version of it. In fact, so I, I, what I want to do is I want to implement it in our library as well. And of course, we wouldn't we would use it from some other library. And even then, I would say in real modern JavaScript, this would be the uh, how we'd implement it because object assign now does it now does what extend used to do it's become so popular um, it's not in all browsers yet but it's become so popular that by spec object assign is just going to do that thing but let's go ahead and implement it ourselves so any extend function is going to have a first parameter passed in it's going to have a second parameter passed in and then it's going to have the remainder of its parameters passed in. So notice we don't need to do arguments and slice it. We just do dot, 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 rest. And the rest of our arguments will be expanded into an array. So at this point, uh, we're, we can go ahead and do something like, well, what do we want? We want uh, all of the keys of the second object, all the values of all the keys in the second object, copied into the first. So for 
uh, let key of object dot keys second first key equals second key. So what's happening here? First we have object dot keys. This is going to go ahead and grab the, all the keys of a second object. And the second, we probably haven't seen for of. So as you're aware, for in go ahead goes ahead and actually iterates the keys. Uh, we could have used for in, except then we would have to check whether the second has own property key and account for prototypal inheritance. Object.keys will already do that. So th this is a little more uh, useful in this situation. And then for each one of them, go ahead and assign it. Um, one thing uh, that this doesn't account for, if there is no second thing, if like undefined is passed in. So let's go ahead and use our Boolean coercion and say, okay, if there, if, set, if there is second, use that. Otherwise, if it's falsy, use an empty object. The keys of an empty object are empty. So we're going to go ahead and iterate zero times. And then finally, we're going to return. And returning is going to be easy if rest.length is zero. Then that's it. We're done, right? We just merge second into first and we're done. Otherwise, go ahead and stand first and take all the parameters of, uh, take the rest of it and expand it as if the other stuff. So the first parameter of rest will become the second and the remainder would become rest. So really nice and easy, super simple uh, implementation of it. Um, and now let's actually go ahead and use it. So one thing I want to point out, create element. All we're doing is creating a thing and assigning a property. That's the use case for extend, right? So what we could do here is say L is document create element tag name, extend that with text content, text, con oh, we know we already, we don't have to do that. So just with a text content and then we don't need this anymore. And really we don't need this anymore, right? And we don't need that. And because the single line function now, we don't need that either. So now create element just becomes a single simple line of code. So now we go ahead and go ahead and refresh. Oh, and we do have an error. Where's our error? Oh, what I say, what I screw up? Error utility unexpected token. Ah, let's see. First, yes, <laughs> that would help if I actually made this a function instead of just. So again, I could have used the function keyword there. Would have been a good idea, maybe in this case. It would have prevented that error. And there we go, and everything's comes back. So um, again, just keep in mind, these are like the features of JavaScript that make it really nice and really easy uh, to work with. Um, I want to, so this right here is the GitHub, uh, be the sexiest. Um, I'm going to also go ahead and put this up, um, this talk up on my blog, togenhero.github.io. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really recommend taking this, cloning this, running through the steps. If you look at under tags, you'll see all these tags that I've talked about. So step zero, that's good. That's kind of your base. But then if we look at, you know, step one, we're, we're actually adding uh, some stuff. So it's public JavaScript, create notification queue. So we're adding some stuff and we can go ahead and look at it at different tags. So create step four, is when we we went and refactored our show notifications. Um, so I recommend taking it, running through through it, and uh, kind of looking at the uh, the slight differences and uh, really practicing using these functions because they are very very useful and really make working with JavaScript uh, a heck of a lot more fun. All right, so uh, thanks a lot. 
Um, I'll put this up one more time. Uh, feel free to contact me with any questions um, or if you or leave any issues or notes on the GitHub site. Thank you very much.